Welcome to our Spring 2015 uh, final presentation and commencement ceremony for our Hate Crimes Internship Program. Uh, these students you see before you have participated this semester in about 15 meetings, hearing from their uh, wonderful instructor whom you're about to meet, and from experts in the field of hate crimes uh, work from the police to the district attorney's office to representatives of various groups within Queens who have experienced hate crimes and had firsthand knowledge um, of the types of experiences these students were struggling to learn about. Now, I think it's important to pause and consider how remarkable it is that these students took time from their busy lives this internship was offered without credit, so it does nothing directly to help them finish their studies, to help them graduate, to help them transfer, to help them uh, with their academic credentials. But they took that time, an hour a week for 15 weeks, to devote to this study. Uh, these aren't the kind of internships that I had as a kid. None of them did any Xeroxing. None of them answered phones. Uh, none of them sharpened pencils in the mechanical sharpener, which they missed out on that. That's actually quite soothing. Um, these students studied, and they thought, and they compared their lives to the lives of people they were um, struggling to understand. And you'll hear in their presentations how profound an impact that has had on them. Uh, we have one more visitor we waited for. So, it's okay, uh, just one of those, turn, yeah, perfect. Um, so, what are hate crimes? Why is a Holocaust Resource Center teaching about them? Um, so, hate crimes are crimes committed out of a prejudicial animus towards a particular group or type of people be the religious-based, um, be it uh, class-based, be it any kind of basis that has nothing to do with who that individual is and has everything to do with which group that person belongs to. So uh, in thinking about the Holocaust, although it's a bit anachronistic, the term didn't exist at the time, uh, neither did the term Holocaust, but the Holocaust can be thought of as one of the largest and most horrendous hate crimes that has ever occurred. As you know, Jews were targeted for who they were as a group rather than for who they were as individuals. That being said, hate crimes don't just happen in Europe, as I'm sure you're aware. Here was one recent case I just pulled from the, from the news um, of a young refugee from Guatemala who uh, moved to the U.S. when he was 14. And two years later, he was killed by a group of white teenagers. So on the one hand, it could just be coincidence that a group of white teenagers killed a young refugee from Guatemala. But in the discussion with the police officers who arrested them, the boys happened to mention that uh, they had just gone out guat hunting that night and he was the, the Guatemalan that they had found to attack. So in the criminal justice world, being able to tie a particular crime to a particular prejudice that motivated that attack can make the punishment more extreme, but outside of the criminal justice system, we understand completely what it means, that a group of people went out looking for a Guatemalan to beat up, and they found one, and they they killed him. Um, I just moved here from the University of Southern California, where in a period of about two years, three Chinese students were murdered. Two of them at the same time in their car, who were just speaking late one night, were shot. And another Chinese uh, graduate student was beaten with a pipe, and then he made it somehow home. And in the morning, in his own bed, he was dead. Uh, 
I wanted to sh give you a little bit of a quote to, to back up my claims about the Holocaust being a hate crime. Uh, this is a quote from the Governor General of the Occupied Polish Territory. So what that means is when the Nazis invaded Poland in 1939, they divided the country into three sections. He was the director of the General Gouvernement, which was the middle part of Poland, which was designed as kind of one gigantic concentration camp for Poles and Jews. Before they built camps, they just shoved the undesirables into this one region. And Hans Frank had a powwow with Hitler, and this is four days later, he's speaking to his own people, and he says, we must exterminate the Jews wherever we find them, and wherever it is at all possible to do so. We cannot shoot these 3.5 million Jews, we cannot poison them, but we must be able to intervene in a way which somehow achieves a successful extermination. So obviously this is hate crimes on a massive scale perpetrated by a government against a massive population, three and a half million people. So at the same time, someone could ask, well, what does this, if you're saying this is a hate crime, and you're saying three kids in Florida just randomly going out one night and killing this one guy, that's also a hate crime. What is it that connects these two events? They're so different. And I think that the answer is that even the Holocaust started with small random killings of individuals and in the decades before, and that started the society on a pathway towards massive killing and massive violence. So the lesson, I think, for us is, what are the kinds of small, everyday things that happen around us that, left unchecked, might lead to this type of massive uh, human rights violations, murder? Here's just a little chart. I'm not sure how readable it is, but this is the five years leading up to 2013 of hate crimes against particular groups in the United States. And I think it's interesting, I'm not sure exactly what to make of it, but you'll notice that um, the hate crimes against Jews is the highest per capita rate. It's, eight point, it's 85 almost for every 100,000 Jews. That means 85 Jews out of every 100,000 was a victim of a hate crime. And yet, if you look at violent hate crimes, you'll see that um, there are much, much higher rates in other groups, and mostly against blacks. So it's, it happens to a smaller number, the violent kind, but so again, there's a continuum between the kind of desecrating a cemetery to physically attacking someone. And unfortunately, hate crimes against Jews didn't stop in Europe with the Holocaust, however much we would have wished it was. This is a chart almost covering the same period of Europe by country. So you'll notice, for instance, and this is percentage. So for the year 2012-2013, in Belgium, for instance, 7% of Jews reported being the victims of an anti-Semitic incident. For the five years, it was 10% of Jews. That means one out of every 10 Jews was a victim in Belgium. So hate crimes, is more of the larger umbrella that allows us to take the temperature, to take the pulse of a culture, and see, are we moving towards acceptance and inclusion, or are we moving down a pathway which could eventually lead to mass violence and mass atrocity? And it's very important as a society, this is a quote from uh, an Armenian scholar that I always liked, that it's important to inoculate ourselves with the anti-genocidal vaccine, and we'll talk about what that is in a second, so that we can prevent this from happening as we grow up on this planet. It's so important to learn about the tragedies of the past and hope they will teach us something about not doing it again in the future. So uh, Dr. Dekmejian believes that it's by studying these incidents, by learning to appreciate firsthand what it means to suffer one of these types of attacks, to be excluded, to be identified, to be victimized, that inoculates us, he feels, against the possibility of each of us one day being prejudiced against another, expressing that prejudice, ignoring another human being suffering, up to attacking another human being, up to motivating others to attack on a massive scale. I'm sorry. These students, are the beginning of that process through learning about hate crimes and then through their kind of final projects that you'll hear about today these students have 
taken it in, they've digested, and they've produced something. They have articulated a vision for how we could try to stop or mitigate hate crimes in our own society. That last step, moving from education to action, that's the pivotal first step from moving from sort of being the sponges that college teaches us all to be into being agents in an ideal human society, which is what we're all going for. So we're here today, to put it in a kind of cheesy way, but to celebrate the emergence of four activists from being students to being agents and uh, from being people who might witness hate crimes to being people who might intervene and stop the development of hate crimes right at its source. We have a lot of people to thank for this course, not just this semesters, but in the past. Our city council members, Paul Vallone, Dan Drum, and Rory Lansman have all supported this program. We have our QCC faculty who helped us develop it, including Ted Rosen, who's here, and um, Rosemary Akis, who's supposed to be here with her class. They might show up late. Uh, we have the, I just wanted to name the speakers that came this semester. Um, and uh, finally, I want to thank and at the same time introduce you to the instructor from this semester's program, um, Jennifer, please. All right, good afternoon. Thank you so much to everyone who's come in today to help us celebrate our four interns who have honestly been a pleasure to work with this past semester. Um, basically what the internship program is, as was briefly explained by the director, is that we bring these students in and it works a bit differently than our other two internship programs that focus on the Asian comfort women during World War II and Holocaust testimonials. This internship focuses primarily on educating students about hate crimes, which is a very modern idea. Um, as the director mentioned, hate crimes came into the, you know, the legal lexicon post-World War II. And legislation across the country, both in the federal and state level, is a very modern uh, development and new classes are being added to it all the time. Uh, we generally bring in a series of speakers who work at different agencies throughout the city, namely the NYPD or the Queens District Attorney's Office, specializing in hate crimes, and we open with them to help provide our students with a bit of a introductory course into what hate crimes are and how the state responds to them. And then after that, we have speakers from different uh, civic groups come in. We had a, actually a Queensboro professor come in. She spoke about the Charlie Hedbo incident that happened this past winter. And because we really want to make sure that we have, we have our students' eyes on both American hate crimes, but also the fact that they do exist outside the borders, as was addressed in the previous uh, talk. Um, one thing that is very interesting to this project that we did focus on primarily is that with American hate crimes, there is a large difference between them and European hate crimes, namely because of the laws we have on the books in America. Specifically, the First Amendment protects speech, and that does protect hate speech and hateful speech. And we've had a lot of discussions within our past you know, few months together about what, at what point do you cross that line from hateful speech to a hateful action. And that's a very important distinction in America that European countries usually don't hold on to. Uh, for example, uh, there are several countries in the European Union where it is illegal to deny the Holocaust. In America, Holocaust deniers are allowed to speak freely of their opinions as long as the speech remains that speech. Um, so basically the setup of this presentation today is these four great students are first going to give a brew presentation. It's going to focus on hate crimes and provide you a bit of a primer as to what hate crimes entail. Uh, they'll include the introduction, um, an introduction segment, segment that goes over the timeline of how hate crime legislation developed in America. Uh, we're going to have two students actually present both the arguments for and arguments against hate crimes because there are a certain number of people who do not agree with the idea of legislating in this area. And finally, we're going to have a student talk a little bit about why the Holocaust Resource Center sponsors such an internship, why it is so important for us to have this conversation in this community. And then each of the students will also rep, uh, will present a individual project that they've created. Uh, some of them will be speaking about specific hate crimes, and some will be speaking about specific communities that are often the victims of hate crimes. So with that, I'm going to turn it to the students, and I'm going to let them uh, begin their presentations. Thank you again so much for coming. All right.
right, so this is just a bit of background for hate crimes in New York City, how they're perceived. How is a hate crime defined? In New York, it's a particular offense against an individual based on perceptions of race, gender, or reli religious beliefs. This means, oh, sorry. <laughs> this means um, there are targets out there where people have very personal animosity towards a certain group. For example, um, just last month, there was a man in Long Island who ran over a Sikh man who thought he was Muslim. And that connects with that. Federal government does not consider hate crimes to be a federal offense. However, it is pursued as a crime of civil rights violations. At the current moment, in New York City, we have some of the most strong we have some of the most effective hate crime laws that I believe. Investigation and prosecution. Often victims will have trouble recanting their stories because of, because of linguistic barriers. During, how, during an um, investigation on a hate crime, the story is it's not very accurate because it, can por it portrays many vantage points. Some, sometimes, um, the victim will recant the story, won't be as accurate as the first time coming around. Suspects have many loopholes for late uh, hate crime cases. For instance, judges are free to permit evidence that nullifies uh, persecution if both sides are under the same protected class. Another example of this was um, a, um, um, a man having dinner, uh, I believe it was in the East Village, I'm not sure. He was assaulted by another um, homosexual, and they were still considering if it was a hate crime because they were both under the same protected class of LGBT community. The Michael Sandy Act is working to reverse this, where you, even if they are in the same class, they could still be prosecuted for the hate crime. Some protected classes, there is race, creed, color, age, national origin, gender, sexual orientation, if you're disabled or handicapped, marital status, and there is one last one. Does anyone care to give a venture out to what it is? No? Because we all, we're, we're all from Queens, so I'm pretty sure most of us will, would um, feel, feel it one, one way or another, but it's citizenship, alienation, when someone is isn't um, born in the U.S. They they come from a different country, so that is a protected class. Hate crimes and bias incidents. Now this is where it gets kind of mixed up. Hate crime is directed at a particular individual or group where direct threats are made. This can include hostile speaks and acts of aggression. This isn't to get mixed up because there are a lot of stories over the internet and over the news where there are fraternities, sororities, other people of uh, other people and just groups where they host certain parties of very very ra the very racist parties. That's a bias incident. Bias incidents are directed at groups of uh, certain interests but do not rise to the level of crime. So they use the First Amendment to their advantage where they target a specific group. Now, some history behind this. In the beginning of 1989, the Hate Crime Statist uh, Statistics Act was introduced into the Department of, uh, reintroduced into the U.S. House of Representatives the Department of Justice began um, harvesting data, basically taking data and publishing it to let let the country see um, what what crimes were motivated by hate. It's a very important benchmark that we still use to this day to to try to understand where and what particular groups are being more targeted, such as our director said, where Jews are. 85 out of 100,000, they, they are the highest rate of um, people being assaulted. 
Now, this act, the Matthew Shepard Act, Matthew Shepard was a man in um, the late 90s who was assaulted primarily based on his sexual orientation. It, uh, it was a law uh, written in, uh, it, was a fe it's writ it was a written uh, federal law where it was enhanced to, for the LGBT community to remove um, the condition where you had, in order to be protected under the law, you might, you had to participate in a uh, federal mandate activity, which means in order to, I'm sorry, in order to be, I'm sorry, a bit nervous. In order, in order to be protected under the law, you needed, you needed to be covered under, under a federal, federal stature, is basically what I'm trying to say. The Hate Crime Bill of New York, introduced in 1990, this, um, this law was focused on upgrading the penalty of a hate crime uh, for, primarily for victims of uh, sexual orientation. After 11, re 11 revisions, um, Governor George Pataki enacted the bill which allowed punishments of the nature to be swift, severe, and just. This meant if a, crime, if a hate crime was committed in New York City, the weight of it was felt. Before the revisions, there were many, um, many uh, Republicans and Democrats that argued for, which you'll hear later in the, pro, uh, in the argument we have with two students, which let them, which, um, let them claim that hate crime, it's a very gray area. There is no specific, there is no, there, you, there is no specific, they can't, there can't be a specific attack because of, of, of that certain moment. And that's it for that. Um, I invite the Natasha and Stephanie to come up. I'm Natasha. I'm Stephanie. We did a debate on hate crime legislation. So I did the pros and she did the cons. The pros were the legislation is needed by protecting the group under hate crimes. Legislation will make the public aware that the group is vulnerable, has been extensively victimized in the past, and is needed for protection. Offenses involving act, actual or perceiving race, color, religion, or national origin, and they shall be imprisoned not more than 10 years, fined in accordance with this title, or both. This also goes for use of dangerous weapon if they harm them. Um, at least three black people eight black people, three white people, three gay people, three Jewish people, and one Latino person become hate crime victims every day. Um, according to the, what happened to the FBI hate crime, sorry, statistics, there were a total of 8,152 hate crimes reported around the country. Right. So I did cons. There's some people that don't agree with the hate crime legislation. And I came up with saying that they are more harmful than ordinary crime examples. In the Family Research Council, they says, by granting special consideration to victims of politically incorrect crimes, the legislation denies equal protection. And another source that I used was in, in Jacobs and Potter 1997. It was mentioned that gang violence and black on black has devastated inner city life for decades, while there are street crimes that are exactly widespread and destabilizing society. The laws are unfair. American justice bases everything on a principle that every single person is treated the same. This would advance the claim that homosexuality is normal and natural. This law would grant privileges to gays and lesbians because it would identify them as a protected class, untouchable. There are crimes against lesbians and gays that are recognized. Then homosexuals would have stronger decisions to claim equality. 
I wanted to go into politics, so I decided to use a real time with Bill Maher. Maher. So I don't know if many of you know about his episodes, but in one of his episodes, he said that the right of a bigot to walk down the street is the same right of a drag queen to walk down the street. You attacked one group, every group will suffer. There are individuals who receive less sentences because of their emotional state. It shouldn't be based on their emotional state. There should be. There should never be a reason to kill someone. An example was used by an example that Bill Hammer used in his in his show was about Tyler Clementine. He was a musical high school college student in Rogers University, and he was targeted. He was bullied because he was gay, and that lo- that gained him to commit suicide, which is something that no one should do. He was at a very young age to be losing his life. Another theory that I came across was externality, externality theory. Hate crime legislation is that hatred harms others who are not direct victims of the criminal's crime. The state never has to prove that the crime is greater in the sense of harming others. For example, an arsonist who sets fire is not believed to scare other property owners that their property may be next to burden. And for last, I came across proving that hatred is a motivation is costly and difficult. Harm to others that the actual victim is not actually proven. It's believed that the criminal is punished for the unproven crime. And an article that was interesting to me was Louis Rocco. He says, hate laws are a Pandora's box. They can be used to tack on additional penalties or to gain leverage over suspects by threatening additional charges. And that's the completion of our project. Uh, my name is Pedro Montes, but all my friends call me Pierre. This is my third time doing the internship. Uh, I really appreciate all the opportunities, all, all the resources for the Holocaust Center have provided to us. Sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, it's public speak. It's not my forte so far. So you're doing better than me. <laughs> Um, well, for uh, hate by definition is an intense or passionate dislike. However, for people that become victims of hate, the definition of the hate is not enough. People that become a target of hatred, they become scared for life. The permanent paranoia that some might obtain or threat against you or the feeling of being chased, people will never be able to live as a regular human being. We should, okay, thank you which in my perspective is human taking others' human right of freedom without even going to jail. People victims of hate, they become vulnerable or refuge among their people. It's not healthy that people that are part of society should be segregated regardless of group, religion, entities, and sexual orientations, among others. We all are unique and different, even science can prove it through genetics. And at the end of the day, we all human and have the same features, the only difference that each individual have different preference, but hate shouldn't be one of them. Uh, also, this internship of hate crimes, it correlates also for the internship of the, ho- the Holocaust testimonials um, comfort women, because even though they are not exactly the same in the past several years ago, you have an element of hate in elephant because it's targeting groups. As you can see, there is example of across the room of all the genocides happened throughout history. I think it's really important to be able to understand that even though it wasn't targeted because of hate, you have that, that dislike of like hatred to be able, like in the case of Adolf Hitler, they was purifying the bloodlines for Jewish in Germany. Um, for the comfort women, well, it's a little more difficult to point it out, but is they were completely uh, denigrated and they were completely in- unequal to the other ones, and that was I also correlate to the uh, for the hate that it corresponds to this internship. Thank you. All right, so. For my individual project, I was working back and forth with Ms. Hickey to um, get a good grasp on what I wanted to talk about for a project. And I decided to do it for the elderly because I am a caretaker for my parents. And I've seen many, many stories where seniors are just getting abused. They're targeted for their money. They're targeted because they walk slow and they're easy target to hit. 
So without further ado, there we go. How can seniors be a target? Seniors are generally unsus unsuspected to be assaulted or under duress under the nature of a hate crime. If any of you are out in New York City, you will constantly look over your back because you don't know when the next you know, crazy person is going to come, come at you or shove you on the train. But for seniors, it's even worse because they're not very active of their surroundings. They have one trip planned and that's how the trip's going to be. They never expect what, uh, that for them to be a target of anything. Um, this is something I defend most of the time, but they're willing to help in many difficult situa situations, usually monetary, after befriending someone, not understanding the repercussions that could potentially follow. That in itself becomes very, very, it's scary to see because many, you'll see many people, people out in Flushing, out in Queens, out in New York City, generally we aren't, we aren't very mean people. And when it comes to senior, senior citizens, the elderly, they're very supportive of just problems they hear. And there are many stories. There was a um, story in 2010 of June where in our local community of Bayside, there was a, a woman who befriended a 23-year-old and a 33-year-old. They constantly came over our house to help her out, to help her go get groceries, but under her nose, they constantly stole money from her in her room, in her house. They took whatever they found to sell it. A bit of knowledge. There's no definite statistic for, uh, for hate crimes among seniors, and I looked up and down. I looked at the FBI website, Department of Justice, but there are plenty of sort reports of assault, grand larceny, and other harmful acts. If I could refresh your memory from a year or two back, in Brooklyn and in the Bronx and in Manhattan, there were teenagers running around playing something called a knockout game where they would approach unsuspecting people and try to hit them in the temple or wherever they feel would be a soft spot for the, for the victim to pass out. In this example, a 72-year-old man in 2013 in the West Village was spotted as an easy target at in a string of knockout attacks. He suffered from brain hemorrhaging and is still recovering right now. For more recently, a hate crime can also, doesn't have to be an assault. It could be victimizing, victimizing someone through their finances. It's just attacking them any way they can. More recently, um, about a few days ago, there was about five or six people who were uh, brought, uh, prosecuted for taking advantage of elderly homeowners in Albany. They were scammed out of $31,000 for fraudulent repairs in the house, for the roof, for the garage, and uh, so forth. What could be done to prevent these people from coming into my community? My community. So a lot of you, I don't know where you, where you all live, but I'm sure you, you have that one nice person you see around that's very old, in their 60s, in their 70s, that you care for. Maybe not so much, maybe they're kind of mean sometimes and they don't say hi to you when you say hi to them. <laughs> but um, this, is, this one is just a very important rule of thumb because you never see it on the news, but you see it, you hear about it in police reports. Report any and all scammers that roam around your neighborhood claiming to be a part of major utility service. One very popular one is people claiming to be with Con Edison. They knock on every single door, and when they see an old person, they'll, they, they could, they'll consider a very easy target. Keep law enforcement updated whenever you see something suspicious. These particular criminals are very observant and prey on unsuspecting elderly individuals from a distance, meaning you can be in a big crowd, you can be at a senior center. There can be people that pretend to be very supportive, but they do have a motive, whether it be to, whether it be monetary or whether it be um, a physical, uh, a, ver a very strong hate. What can be done to help them at the moment, really? It's very difficult to pinpoint criminals um, that target the elderly due to its complex nature. There is no particular age where 
you can pinpoint, there's no demographic where you can pinpoint a criminal, uh, pinpoint a group of criminals and say, all right, these people are from 21 to 34. They range all the way from as young as we are to 50. Talk to your elders, grandparents, or neighbor, uh, neighbors, or any, anyone else who may, might be of age, because seniors, they're very unsuspecting sometimes. They are, some of them are just most incredibly kind people in the world, and they never know that they, um, they can be a target. Advocate, advocate, and advocate. <laughs> Old people may have a hard time remembering, but your friends and peers will keep this information in mind, and it needs to be heard. All of us have old people in our lives, or we are going to grow old eventually, you need to keep this in mind, because one day you're going to be walking down the street, you're going to see a nice young man help you pick up your groceries and you drop them, and that can be the beginning to something very terrible. And that is the end of it. Thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Stephanie, and I decided to do a project on hate crime against people with disabilities. I decided to choose this as my topic because since at a very young age, I was at one point in my life considered to be disabled because I wasn't paying attention in class and I used to act a certain way, but no one knew the story behind that. I, as a person, as a child, I had a tough, tough childhood. Um, let's say that I had an abusive father, so due to that, and certain circumstances, I didn't behave the, the way I was supposed to in school. And until high school, I think it was, I spoke to advisors and I spoke to some people that, you know, really touched me. And they helped me understand that you can do anything you put your mind to. And at that moment, I decided I loved school. That I didn't do it for parents, I didn't do it for friends, I did it for myself, that I wanted to be someone. So nowadays when I take the bus, I don't always have to drive. When I take the bus, I see a person disabled in a wheelchair and people making fun of them. And you know, sometimes it's bad to stay quiet and not do anything for it, but sometimes you're supposed to speak. So I actually speak to the bus driver and I tell him, you know, why don't you do something about it? Those kids are picking on the person. So the bus driver stands up and he talks to them. And because of that, I decided to do my project on it. I did a little investigation, and you know, a lot of people don't know about the crimes against kids with disabilities. And it's only 1.36% in the United States right now, and bullying is a big thing towards them. Because kids that are not disabled, they believe that they have, they're more capable of other stuff, which is not true. People that are with disabilities have a lot of gifted, gifted things in them. Not only arts, they have, they think outside the box. They don't think like us. Some of them have very, very good feelings, great feelings. They make you think differently. Like I have a friend that she has dyslexia and people make fun of her. And you shouldn't make fun of someone that has dyslexia. Instead, you should encourage them, fix that, get that done. You can still become someone. Her brother had dyslexia, and now he's a social worker. You could become anything you want, not because someone's telling you that you have disabilities, you can. Some forms of disability that I've came across are people with, mm -hmm. immune deficiency syndrome, learning disorder, learning disability, and Down syndrome or cerebral palsy. They are often targeted because they're most vulnerable in comparison to those who are non-disabled. And some of them are victims to get vi through violent criminal acts and end up requiring assistance for being hospitalized, three times more likely than someone that's not disabled. Society has come to develop a language to defer violence towards the disabled in comparison to violence towards other violence. The example that they use are aversive treatment that describes assault that are being made. Time out describes when the person is locked in a dark room. And neglect is when they are being tortured. A case that I came across that has interested me for quite some time was a case back in Philadelphia in 2011. It was called the Basement of Horrors. There was five individuals. There was one person that was called 
Linda Ann Watson, and she was the age of 52. She was a ringleader of the crime. She got her daughter involved and three other males. Her idea was that she wanted to be boss. So she, she imprisoned two, three adults and two children in her basement dungeon. She, what, what um, they ended up saying was that she prostituted two of the young women. She starved them to death and some of them suffered from meningitis and some of them died. She was a woman that kept these people in subhuman conditions. Subhuman conditions is treated like dogs, like you know, like pets. Not even pets were treated like that. They weren't fed at a certain time. They were skinny to their bones. It was what you consider horror, like a really horror story. Uh, she ended up, you know, receiving the penalty of death due to everything that she had done. And until this day, Philadelphia has known about this incident and has kept it towards their hearts that you shouldn't treat people that are disabled any other way than any other human. You should encourage them. You know, sometimes you don't want to conversate with someone that speaks a lot, someone that doesn't know how to act or they speak too loud or they act inappropriately sometimes. But instead of judging them, you should actually speak to them. Is everything okay? What can I do to help you? You know, talk to them like human beings. You know, the more you laugh on a person, the more you pick on a person. Instead of making it easier for them, you're going to make it worse for them and for yourself. Hate crimes have been, on, have been going on for years now. And in most recent bias breakdown of 2013, we are informed the statistics of criminal acts of disabled people was 1.4 out of 100. Due to their percentage, a lot of people have not become aware of the importance and seriousness of this topic. Usually these victims that are disabled, and they're not being approached as hostile. They're being approached as they want to be your friend. And in some incidents, it has occurred, even like he had mentioned earlier, about elderly. They uh, approach you as they want to become your best friend so they can know about your, you know, Chase account or how much property do you own or do you have social security? Are you being benefited? Just these people, they want to steer your money away. So sometimes it's, you can't really tell. I've been told, I've spoken to some people that, you know, some children that are disabled and I have come across that it's something that I really, really love and I want to continue as my passion. Um, I want to help these kids. I want to help, you know, try to speak to these adults. I've met, I've come across one adult that has disabled and she told me that when she was at the age of 12, everyone picked on her and bullied her in school and she didn't think that she was going to go on to college. She is right now in Stanford University and she tells me that she wants to go in for psychology. She wants to major in psychology because she's, she knows where people are coming from. She knows how to interact with people. It took her five years to deal with her syndrome, and she has recovered from it. She's getting better. And I'm telling you, as I, I believe that a person is able to change. If they put their passion and they put everything, their mind and effort into it, you can't completely change, but you can make yourself better. And you can make society respect you. For who you are. Be yourself and you live a happy life. Hi, I'm Natasha. I did the LGBTQ hate crimes. The problem is, um, I picked one article that I found on May 2015, just recently in New York. A possible anti gay hate crime was caught on video at Dallas BBQ restaurant. The victim, Jonathan Snipes, was on video shown as a middle-aged man was caught shouting anti-gay slurs and then shown a chair being crushed over his head and Snipes falling to the floor. Snipes suffered head injuries as well as cuts to his ears. Stop the hate, guys. <laughs> um, let's see if this video works. Hate crime this morning. We hear from the victim. More from CBS News Janelle Burrell. 
Look closely at this cell phone video and you can see the man police are looking for this morning. The suspect inside this Dallas BBQ restaurant in Chelsea first shoving Jonathan Snipes to the ground. He then appears to stomp on Snipes. Before slamming a wooden chair onto him while he's down. The force leaving painful bruises and cuts on Snipes' head. Snipes spoke exclusively with CBS2 after spending several hours with detectives at NYPD's hate crime unit, now investigating the case as a possible bias attack. Witnesses say the brawl appears to have started because of a knocked over drink. They say words were first exchanged on the night of Cinco de Mayo just after 11 p.m. between the six foot four bearded suspect and Snipes, who had been at the restaurant with his boyfriend. The suspect ran off. It was violently dangerous. It was out of control to even speak. Isam Sharif recorded the video. <laughs> Snipes, still dealing with his injuries, says there's no excuse. Any violent act against any other, any New Yorker, I not condone, but especially when any things are protected, whether it's your race, your religion, or your creed. Um, as you can see, he got beat up because he was with his boyfriend at the restaurant, which is never nice because it's hate crime. It's horrible. <clears throat> hate is a choice. Homosexuality is not. I found a solution that every community should have a workshop once a week where those who feel unaccepted go with their loved ones to help them understand their life, to better themselves and not feel ashamed or scared of what others might think. They should also include people who might not be open to this as well to give them an understanding of how the LGBTQ individuals feel and their lifestyle. Maybe they can relate to some degree the pressure they have to try and fit in or relate to the fact that they were someone's child and harm to them hurts their loved ones. No matter who you are, you can connect to their pain. Building their confidence and helping them feel comfortable in their home should be a must. Not only them, but having confidence in yourself and supporting them shows how strong you can be too. This also goes with, oh sorry, with transgender. Um, I think we all know about Bruce Jenner. He turned into K Caitlyn Jenner. Yeah, so I think that gives people confidence because when role models and influential people on the media change, um, people around them like accept them and it helps. Everyone loved. <laughs> Thank you. Hello again. Um, my hate crime I that I choose to talk about is LGBT also as well. I mean, from my background, I grew up with a re bitter religious background with my mom. She is evangelist. And so she was, seeing I was grew up as a German, I wasn't able to understand much. So I, I tend to, I, I created like a hate for homosexuality. I, it wasn't like actually like doing acting, but it was like rejecting about it because probably because I identify myself with it. So. Now that I understand it, I feel in the other way. I have several gay friends too, and they have been suffering for LG LGBT cases of hate crime. I can't completely understand the other side of it. So in the case of Scott Jones, is a gay Canadian man left paralyzed after a late hate crime. Uh, he remained um, in critical condition at a hospital in Nova Scotia. He went stabbed twice in the back and his throat was slashed. Although the injury in Detroit was uh, superficial, the two stop in the back gave him completely no movement from the waist down. And uh, her friend, uh, his friend, uh, believed that this was considered as a hate crime because at the time that he was walking uh, out of the uh, out of the church, I mean, of the like the. Uh, 
the opening of his friend art studio, he's being attacked. He only got attacked uh, attacked by him. The the, f the friend didn't suffer anything, probably because he was openly gay. That's her his friend assumed. That was why he was beat up and stabbed twice. So in these cases like this, it's made me think like the video that we just showed that I might be in that position too. I mean, people are afraid of hate crimes. You don't know what could happen to you. You could be Jewish and you can go out with your friends as a regular evening and then you suddenly get attacked because of a hate crime. So it's, it's made me think, like, how would be they feel if they've been targeted like that? If it is like they will, they will feel the same about doing the hate crime without even thinking just at the heat of the moment. So there is much more to think about when it comes to hate. Because even though the first, uh, one of the laws that you protected by the speech, uh, free, free, uh, freedom of speech, speech, sorry. I mean, there is a tendency that you can be, say something and then do act something. I mean, even though you don't like it, you, you can easily turn your head to the other side instead of doing something irrational and attack a person. It's completely humane. Yeah, I think that shows like the, the worst part of, of us in cases like this. So yeah, even though for Islam and Jewish people having, even recently you have like this, the, the anti-Islam rally, and I just think about how they feel they supposed to, they come from, from another country in here to have a better future, and then they feel like completely rejected, and they, emotionally they, they don't feel right, and for that I think that we should be learn to be tolerant, even though you don't believe it or you are, you believe are completely the opposite, at least you should be able to respect it regardless of sexual orientation, religion, uh, in a cities and group. So, thank you. All right, thank you again to all four of our students. Let's give them another round of applause. I thought it was fantastic. And I believe now we'll be doing the certificates. Yes. And I want to thank you all for coming and joining with us on this tremendous occasion. And students, please stay for a big group shot. And uh, thank you all so much for joining us. I just have a couple quick announcements. I, I, I like doing that. Um, Sunday, we have a really interesting lecture from a scholar at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum at 1 o'clock. It's on the ship, the St. Louis, which was a German ship that was filled full of refugees who were trying to find a dock in the uh, Americas to try to uh, be saved. Um, and they were turned away at three different North American ports and the ship ended up sailing back to Germany where most of those people lost their lives. Um, one of the survivors is uh, one of our uh, friends and one of the survivors who speaks to students here. And uh, she's very excited about the lecture. And Scott Miller's book that he co-wrote really traced out, there were 927 people on the ship and they traced out the fates of every one of those 927 people. So it's a remarkable project. And um, next week, we have the opening of our brand new permanent exhibit. You notice the hallways were quite institutional. Uh, feels like I'm in a hospital every time I walk by. Um, it'll be covered with a beautiful exhibit on the lives of Jews in Persia um, from biblical times to the present. So please come back next, I think it opens Friday the 11th, and it'll be up until December. So thank you all for coming.